Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Julie Mulvihill. I'm the Executive Director for Humanities Kansas, and welcome to this month's Big Idea. And we are really happy to use this platform and forum to highlight fresh scholarship and thinking in humanities. And so today's presentation will not disappoint. For those of you who are new to us, please know that you can enter questions throughout today's presentation, either in the Q&A box or in the chat box, whichever you prefer. So we welcome those interactions and encourage you when you think of those questions to put those in there. Each big idea, as you know, begins with a short essay and we circulate that a week or so in advance of the presentation. And hopefully some of you had an opportunity to review that and we'll put that in the chat box for you to look at throughout the presentation as well. Our idea and our hope is that with all of our big idea programs that you take the opportunity to read the essay, to engage in the conversation between um, our scholars here on the screen, and then take that conversation back to your dinner parties, to your garden party with friends, whatever it might be, and really spark that conversation around this big idea. That's why we've provided additional resources in the text, books, and films that you can take a look at to help explore the theme as well. So to begin, I'd like to introduce Dr. Valerie Mendoza, who will then uh, introduce our special guest. Dr. Mendoza is a Topeka native and received her PhD from the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, she works in the public humanities, where her research focuses on the history of the Latinx community, primarily in Kansas, but across the Midwest. And you'll see um, papers and different research crop up. Valerie has done a lot of work with a lot of organizations, including Humanities Kansas, and we're very grateful for that. Um, she has also served as a consultant to the Kansas State Historical Society, the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission, and the National Folklife Network. So welcome, Dr. Mendoza. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Julie, and um, thank you, Marco, for joining us today. Um, Dr. Marco Masias is Assistant Professor of History at Fort Hayes State University. He's a cultural historian with expertise in Latin America and modern Mexico. And he earned his PhD in history from the University of Arizona, and he's been working on a book about Pancho Villa. And so I'm so excited to um, talk about this with you. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about Pancho Villa in pop culture and collective memory. Yes, and Marco is joining us from Sonora, Mexico. So this is like, I don't know, kismet. It's so apropos. So <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, so Pancho Villa is directly related or became famous, I guess we could say, through the Mexican or because of the Mexican Revolution, which is super convoluted. Um, so can you just give us a, a brief background of um, that? You know, when was it? Who were some of the, the key players? How does Villa fit into all of this? I know I'm asking a lot in like sure. a short bit of time. So. Oh, no worries. Uh, we can move on. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the Mexican Revolution is a, a social struggle. It is an armed conflict that starts in 1910 against the dictator or authoritarian president, Porfirio Diaz, that had been in power for uh, upwards of 30 years. And so... Uh, there is discontent among the population. There is a general uprising. And that phase uh, finishes fairly quickly. So uh, the leader of that first phase, Francisco Madero, uh, becomes president, but is unable to quickly deliver on the promises of the revolution. So he is, he is, depo he is deposed by Porfirian elements. And, and so we, we have a return to authoritarianism, if you will. Not, not Diaz himself, he, he goes to exile in Paris, never, never to come back. And then when that uh, authoritarian government is deposed again, then th we go into this kind of a, a civil civil war conflict among different revolu revolutionary factions that are trying to push their agenda in terms of what Mexico should look like 
um, it, and, and, you know, af after 19, after 1910. So the, really the, the armed struggle of the Mexican revolution is from 1910 to about 1921. Um, and so Villa is one of the many protagonists, but definitely one of the most significant um, elements of the Mexican revolution as it pertains to Northern Mexico. So, uh, you know, four of the top, you know, uh, people here are, are uh, Benistano Carranza, Emiliano Zapata in, in South Mexico, Álvaro Obregón and Villa. And so they're all fighting for different things that they, they do see eye to eye on some things, but they have different, they, they have a different approach to what, what Mexico should be. And so that's what, what plays out in the, I would say post 1914, 1915 period. So from 1915 to 1921, these different factions are fighting to assert their, you know, their idea of what Mexico should be. Yeah, it's much more complex because when I think of civil war, or a civil war, obviously my frame of reference is the U.S. civil war where they're the two sides, right? So having these multiple um, factions um, is, uh, is, is, you know, something to wrap my brain around. And so you said Villa was mostly operating in northern Mexico then. Yes. So Villa is, is, and I think this is part of, of, of why Villa is so appealing. Villa is, is definitely like an underdog story. He, he is a, a, a worker. He, he comes from a family that has nothing, uh, uh, you know, dispossessed in, 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 the, in what is the state of, of Durango. Um, according to his own autobiography, he becomes a, a, a bandit after um, saving the honor of his sister and, and wounding the local uh, landed elite. He ends, up in, he ends up in Chihuahua. And so he, he fashions himself on this idea of being a social bandit. The, the, so the idea being kind of this Robin Hood figure. And so by 1910, that's kind of what he's, he's working with. Uh, but in, in looking at some of the primary sources, um, you know, there's always this thin line of how, how prominent was he of, of a bandit. So he is, he, you know, when the revolution starts, he's one of the first persons that says, you know, I'm, I'm here. And he's, he goes up to the mountains and, and starts fighting the, the government forces. So it, it, he really starts little by little and, and he, gained, he, he comes to prominence uh, really by 1913 onward. He, he really is one of the, the forces to be reckoned with, uh, per se. Okay. And so how you write in your essay about um, this, uh, well, a couple of things, <laughs> trying to figure out where to go from here, because uh, there's so much. Um, so one is, well, I guess we'll start with how he came to be in New Mexico, right, which at that time was just barely a state, maybe 10, 10 years, or maybe even, even uh, less. And for those of us who are, who are not good with our geography, New Mexico borders, Mexico, northern Mexico, right? In, 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 in terms of geography, it, it's, it's, you know, I mean, obviously, New Mexico, so it was once part of Mexico. So, that, so there's still like a lot of fluidity in between you know, the, the two countries um, at the border. So, so as part of the revolution, um, he comes in to New Mexico and invades a town called, called Columbus, right? So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yep. Yeah, so, so um, Columbus and Villa, yes. So in 19, he does this in 1916. Uh, in March of 1916, and of course, this will this will push the the what is known as the Punitive Expedition, uh, headed by uh, Black Jack Pershing, um, and and overseen by Frederick Funston. Uh, but uh, so, before we get to Villa, there, uh, what happens is by 19 by by late 1915, the Woodrow Wilson administration has recognized Villa's counterpart as president of Mexico. And after having a pretty cozy relationship with Villa, they were basically allowing Villa to buy uh, guns and ammunition on the other side of the border. So that recognition re really catches Villa off guard. 
Uh, and so by, by late 1915, early 1960, he, he is kind of angry at the United States. Uh, and specifically why he targets Columbus, New Mexico is because according to, to one of the you know, stories is there was a gun runner, uh, Samuel Rebel, that sold him blank ammunition for one of the one of the one of the battles that Villa lost. So he he went to target that specific community in Col of Columbus, New Mexico, which is about a mile or two from the international border, to try to find Rabel and kill him. But Rabel was in El Paso that day, so he could, he couldn't find them. And so they you know, the Villista forces come in. They 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 pretty much destroy the town, and then they they come back after uh, when when the dawn when the sun starts coming up. And uh, the the what 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 is what is so the, the there is a there is a garrison there in Columbus they they are able to defend themselves and then immediately act uh, after the raid they, they 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 ask for permission and they go into Mexico to, to pursue Villa and according to their story uh, they they kill a few Villistas and they come back to, they cross the border because they're running low on ammunition. And this attack, which was the first attack on U.S. soil, really like, like a formal attack per se, is you know the first attack on since the the, the battle the, the the war of 1812. So this is why it's so significant for the U.S. and the borderlands because nobody nobody had dared to attack the U.S. you know on American territory. And Villa was the first to do that in you know in 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 a long time. And almost immediately, like within 24 hour, uh, hours, General Funston was asking permission to to organize the punitive expedition to go down and hunt Pancho Villa. Okay, there's so much to unpack there. <laughs> I did not know the part about Wilson, uh, President Woodrow Wilson, and um, you know, um, kind of even talking with. Uh, you know, with Via. So part of this uh, entry by Via into the U.S. is one, he's angry because Wilson recognized somebody else as uh, instead of him, and then two, because somebody sold Via blank ammunition out of Columbus to Mexico. So this is kind of like retribution, right? He's he's mad. <laughs> Yes, he's he is very mad. And so to the Woodrow Wilson administration, Via in 1913, 1914 is viewed as a very good candidate to be a, a the poss possibly the president of Mexico. Uh even to the fanfare of you know um of the movie uh uh 1914 movie, uh, bi uh, basically a biography of Via produced by by Hollywood uh, and and has has Pancho Villa in some of the scenes. It's it's a it's a movie that's been lost, but it's interesting to 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 fantasize about. You know, in 1914, Villa was viewed as as the possible next president of Mexico, and you know, the newspaper coverage of him was very positive, uh, leading up to 1915. So that it, it really that that's why it, that's why it also like it really hurts Villa when, when his opponent is recognized. Wow. And so this uh, um, raid into Columbus, New Mexico really catapults him <laughs> right into sort of infamy, at least in terms of the U.S. and and the press, because you just said that he was his uh, the press was favorable. But then in 1916, something happens <laughs> right? It, 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 with that invasion, uh, you know, uh, his his. Um, uh, status turns very quickly. Yes, and it's it's really fun to watch like the political cartoons of the of the era because they're you know the, the first two months of the punitive expedition are very hopeful that they're going to capture Via, and then after starting month three, Via goes into hiding and nobody finds him. Nobody can find him for, for, for pretty much most of the summer, and so at that part they're like, is he dead or not? And it's the you know. Newspapers are like, okay, I, I guess it, by October, we, uh, the U.S. is kind of done with the end of expedition, but they're, they're kind of waiting to get out of Mexico. And, and finally, they'll, they'll get out in, in February of 1917 after not finding Villa. So it's, uh, I mean, I, I think I, I love the, like, I, the punitive expedition is fascinating because it's a prelude to the First World War. 
um, because, you know, we're testing out all this technology in the Chihuahuan Desert. And, you know, it, it it's kind of the, we're still using, you know, uh, 19th century equipment, but we're, we're playing around with 20th century equipment. And all that really, you know, uh, be, prior to the First World War, where we kind of go in green, it's it really is a, a wonderful testing ground. And it, it makes, it starts the career to many, uh, you know, prominent generals that will be in charge of the, of the Second World War. Um, so it's, I, I really like talking about the Native Expedition and, and, and um, it's, it's, it's really an interesting segue into the, the First World War and the, ne you know, the next century, so to speak. Yeah. And so this is not the first time that the U.S. invades Mexico, right, um, th through, <laughs> but I imagine that the Mexican government is too busy with the uh, the Civil War going on at this time to, to do any sort of retaliation. Correct. So you, you're right. So there is a history of the U.S. intervening in, in Latin America as a whole. And I think, well, in, in Latin America as a whole, but uh, even to that, you know, uh, uh, General Funston is a really good example of, I mean, he's a rough rider fighting in Cuba. He is, he is, you know, uh, in the Philippines. He, he his career is, is very, is very similar to, to, to Pershing's. Um, um, and it, it, Funston was in charge of invading uh, Veracruz in 1914. So for, for a brief couple of months in 1914, the U.S. decided to invade the coastal town of Veracruz and Fuston was in charge of that attack or, or, or coordination. So uh, it, it was kind of viewed as, as natural intervening, intervening in, in Latin America or in Mexico. Uh, yeah, you're right. In, in 1916, the Carranza government had very little in, in terms of what it could do. Uh, the perception was that he couldn't control Pancho Villa. So the U.S. had to come in and control Pancho Villa for him. But if you the Pontiff expedition was not successful in finding Via, but it, it it was successful in that it was able to disband the Viista soldiers. So that that's that's kind of the the, the praise of the Pontiff expedition. And there's Funston is the connection to Kansas, and we have a photo of him up from the um, Kansas State Historical Society. So can you talk a little bit about? him and his Kansas connection and, and Via and, and how that all fits together? Uh, yes, so uh, uh, Frederick Funston is, um, uh, grew up in, in Iowa, Kansas. Uh, he, I mean, he is one of those fascinating figures that, that, that does so much in so little time. I think he was 50 some years old when he, when he suddenly passed away in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, he, as, as the biography as the biography here says, he was ex, um, natural explorer uh, up in the Grand Canyon, up in Alaska, and then he was one of the rough riders in Cuba. He was, uh, I believe, stationed in the Philippines. Uh, he he was he was in charge when the big earthquake struck in San Francisco. He was the one that you know, every, despite all the destruction, he was the one that kept things calm. Um, and that would allow for the reconstruction. And then he, he was basically in charge of the entire borderlands region. Uh, so he was superior to, to Blackjack Pershing. So it, it was between him and, and Pershing that they were kind of in charge of, of directing the expedition. And honestly, if he hadn't passed away, because he passes away uh, a couple of weeks after the punitive expedition leaves Mexico in, in February of 1917, he suddenly passes from a heart attack. But uh, honestly, he was, he, he had, again, as I mentioned, he has the same credentials as, as Pershing. I think he, he would have been in charge of the American uh, expedition in Europe had he not passed away so suddenly. Wow. Um, and then, you know, we talked about, um... Uh, so you mentioned some of the political cartoons, and I think we have some a, a photo of one of those uh, as well. I just wanted to take a look at so we could see what the the press was saying about uh, Via after that invasion of um, Columbus, New Mexico. Yeah, so so these images are from let's see. Uh, well, these are these are earlier, I think, but but still, I mean, here you you here you have the image of Via 
being this underdog, right? And so this picture here of him standing straight up is from April of 1911. So it, it is really kind of one of the first pictures taken from any press, even Mexican or American, uh, uh, fighting against the, the, the authoritarian here. He, he is, so the, the, the guy sitting down is Victor Ana Huerta. Um, this is when he's creating that myth of, of, of the, the possibility that he can be one, you know, the, the president of Mexico. Uh, so that this is, yeah, it's, um, that's kind of the idea from bandit to military dictator is the, you know, that's how fast he grew up up in prominence. Uh, and that's, you know, exactly a good, a good example of how he's depicted by, by U.S. newspapers in, in the United States. Yeah, and I love, you know, that's sort of the quintessential via image, too, that we're looking at, right? The sombrero, the um, cross, um, the, what do, what do I want to say? Yeah. The, the, the Ammunition. Ammunition. Yes, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> crossing, uh, crossing his chest, the big um the big mustache do we have a um a political art cartoon as well leslie that we could show no i don't have one queued up i'm sorry okay that's fine um but i love too how this is from the el paso herald right so one of those border towns on the u.s side but you know again there's that fluidity at this time with uh with the border um, one of the yes, things for sure. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to show as part of um, the extra uh, resources of your essay was a, a YouTube video or a video. It's a movie that's now on YouTube, uh, a government movie. It's one, one of those shorts that they used to um, show before, you know, the main the main feature, and I think this one is after World War II, sort of between 1945 and 1950, but it's talking about Pancho Villa 30, what, 30, 40 years, 30 years after his death. So again, it speaks to how that raid really made him infamous. So can we cue that up and then we'll talk about it. In Mexico, the bandit forces of Pancho Villa were carrying on brutal, bloody raids aimed at seizing the Mexican government. Pathetic refugees, most of them women and children, streamed by the thousands into the United States in headlong flight from Villa's terror. They were given the protection of army trenches dug to hold the frontier should the bandit war spill across. In 1915, Villa conferred with Americans in Texas and provided this rare portrait. That's Villa, centered with the big mustache. An intrepid cameraman got these equally rare pictures in the rebel chieftain's hideout. At Olmito, Texas, a burning railroad bridge and a wrecked train lying on its side were left in the wake of a shocking bandit attack on American territory. Then on March 9, 1916, came the most defiant Villa raid of all. You are in the wreckage strewn streets of Columbus, New Mexico, the first and only U.S. community to be pillaged by a foreign force since the War of 1812. A rain of bandit bullets took the lives of 17 Americans and aroused the nation to immediate action. In New York and across the country, National Guardsmen poured from their armories to form a punitive expedition into Mexico. Their orders? to pursue and capture the bandit chieftain and bring him back for trial. Crowds lined Fifth Avenue to give the men of the 71st Regiment a rousing send-off. I love, again, you know, this, this is narrated, you know, 30 years after he died and he's the bandit, you know, brutal, bloody, reign of terror. <laughs> yep 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 and and it's funny because you're right it mentions all that but then there's like the rare footage of him in el paso so th that kind of speaks to like he was in communication with he met with, with like there are pictures of him and persian and Duke scott which is what was other than one, one of the other very famous generals of the time um i i was trying to find one of uh, one of of, of via and flintstone but i couldn't find one so 
but there, there, there are many pictures of, of Pershing and Via, which kind of speaks to the, the, the that closeness, if you were, or proximity of Via with the U.S. leading up to 1915. So that's. Um, yeah, this th this clip is, is fascinating also because of the of the political refugees. Because um, nineteen, I you know, talking about the, the the greater frontier, the greater border area, a lot of Mexican refugees and, and you know end up working on railroad lines, and and that's why we have the the some of the first instances of of of, of Mexican workers in the U.S. There's a longer history of of Mexicans working in the United States, but. But uh, there's definitely uh, an influx of, of Mexican immigrants that are fleeing the revolution in the 19 teens. So before we leave the topic of the invasion of New Mexico, we had a question from the audience. Um, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but it's about uh, Pancho Villa State Park um, in, in Columbus. Is, do you know? First, I want you to talk about it. But the, but the actual question is, is this the only state park in the U.S. to honor a foreign invader? <laughs> I'm gonna say yes. I, 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 because, and so I've been to, I've been to the Columbus commemorations in March that they do. So the park is at least was created at least I can't remember if it's in the late 30s or 40s, and it's kind of a place to commemorate the the the, the loss of American lives. Uh, today they today it's 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 evolved into a trans border tradition where in March, close to the anniversary of, of, the, of the attack on Columbus, the US Border Patrol allows for uh, cavalry, men in, on horses from the Mexican side to cross into, into uh, Palomas, to cross into Columbus, and they're welcomed by their Mexican American counterparts on the other side of the border. And they have kind of the, this big fiesta and commemoration and then at the end of the day, they, they ride back into Mexico. It, it's a really fascinating celebration. I, I, I really would call it a commemoration. Um, and, and so, yes, my answer, my short answer is yes. I think it's the only state park that's named after somebody that's attacked the United States. But there, there is, it's a really, and then the, 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 they have a cop, they have one of the armed cars uh, that, sh that, that also appears in, in one of these documentaries. Uh, that that little museum in Columbus, New Mexico, is pretty pretty cool. If you if you've never uh, visited, it's it's a good detour. Okay, so I want to talk about now um, how. So we're you know he died a hundred years ago, <laughs> right? But we're still talking about it. He's still how has his why are we still talking about him? Right? Why is this such a fascinating topic? And then how has his image? kind of morphed throughout the years. Yes, so um, Villa's 100th year anniversary of, of his assassination is coming up uh, now on July 20th. So Villa was assassinated in, this, in the town of Parral, Chihuahua, which is actually the furthest, the furthest south that the Pindic expedition got to. Um, that, that's, he, he settled pretty close to Parral and that's where he was assassinated. And so, I, I think it's part of that fascination with with Villa, uh, of in both Mexico and the United States, because it is really I, I think Villa as a phenomenon is a trans border phenomenon, not only of Mexicans and and bringing those stories because I a, a lot of things that I hear when I when when we talk to when I talk to you know immigrants Mexican American immigrants it's like oh we we left during the revolution because Pancho Villa attacked our community. There's always a Pancho Villa story there, so. It, it, that's that's part of that 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 story, but I think the the importance of Via, and this is is related to pop culture and, and how the collective memory of individuals come together and and promote him as one of these pillars of the revolution. So how is this done, right? So because of his Robin Hood nature, he he really ended up in I don't want to say poverty, but he 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 really redistributed all the wealth that he made among among everybody. Uh, he he was really a social benefactor in in that regard. So after he dies, people kind of kept the, the positive memories of him, and the, a lot of those positive memories memories are are rescued via folk songs, um, and then and then especially in the nineteen thirties and forties through cinema. So even though, for example, the 1935 Viva Villa starring Wallace Berry 
is intended to be kind of this like negative portrayal of Villa. It really is kind of a, they portray Villa as the drunkard, which is, he, he, he was a teetotaler. He didn't drink alcohol. Uh, but the movie was so successful that it, it made the Mexican Revolution a theme even in Europe. So like Wallace Berry, is, Wallace Berry was receiving um, uh, awards in Italy during, fasc- you know, during the rise of fascism. It, it kind of contributes to this, to the fascination of Europeans for what will become spaghetti westerns. And so mm-hmm. the Mexican Revolution is kind of one of these subgenres of a spaghetti western in which Villa is one of the prominent figures of, you know, usually, again, we, we see the, 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 the Mexican revolutionary looks like the image we saw of Villa with the, with the uh, um, bandanas and, and the hats and, and the uh, guns and all that. So, it, but Villa is really one of the few names that like, oh, okay, it's Villa, right? And, and that, that 1935 movie uh, really, really, made headways in 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 rescuing or saving that that name of via especially in the u.s and the european audience and then in mexico it was his veterans that you know after the revolution kind of mm, comes into this consolidating phase via is not on the winning side and so there are efforts on the government side to kind of dismemorize the end like not he's not part of the revolution but his veterans start commemorating his assassination, and little by little, mm. they <clears throat> they they carve out a space into the government in the 1950s, and, and especially not by, by the 60s. Say, okay, you know what? You're right. We we recognize that Via is one of the pillars of the revolution, and that uh, eventually ends up with his his remains being moved from Parral down to Mexico City in what is the, called the Monument of the Revolution. So it's a very gradual process that I would that I argue, had it not been for, for pop culture and collective memory, he would have not been rescued. His image would have, would have, would have not been rescued <coughs> and preserved until today. Wow. That is really interesting. And he's, you know, and, and he's still a, a staple, if you will, in pop culture throughout the years, even up to today. In your uh, big idea, you mentioned um, the tequila bottle. And I know we have an image of that. And so can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Oh, that's the one. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I, okay. Um, as I mentioned, Villa was a tea toddler. He didn't drink alcohol. He he he's really a progressive in that way. He he, uh, I think because living on the border, he he really had very progressive ideas, and and not drinking alcohol was one of them. Um, so, in the nineteen seventies, this tequila company called Punch Villa Tequila uh, opened up shop in the, in the U.S. Uh, banking on Villa's image. And they came out with these decantors, the, these bottles. And there are several of them, but this is one of the most infamous ones, I think, because in order to access the tequila, you have to decapitate via. Now, what is what is kind of fun and fascinating about this is when via was persona non grata, uh, somebody somebody decided to undig the body in 1926 and behead the body. So the 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 body is missing the head and nobody knows where, where the head is. Um, so if anybody has the head, it, it's worth money. Um, allegedly, there's a trigger finger in a, in 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 the in a pawn shop in El Paso. So you if you if you type in tri- uh, trigger finger via trigger finger, you'll find a, a, an image of it. So this tequila bottle is fascinating because the the ori- the, 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 the the original body is missing the head so somebody lost somebody lost the head somewhere along the way wow (laughs) that's really interesting um so what do you think via would say um about how his image is still found in pop culture today and about how he's remembered I think he would get a laugh of, out, out of it. Uh, I, I think he would. He would. He would be. He probably is laughing at this moment. Uh, I, I think he would find it fascinating that people remember remember him. Um, 
and 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 it, it is you know sometimes the, the the ideology might be lost but the the image is still there and that speaks to you know i think any any historical figure and, and how we romanticize uh historical figures uh but i think he would get, he would take he would get, he would laugh his heart out uh in 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 how he's remembered and and these kind of things that he is uh that he is uh portrayed in because so one thing I do as an exercise of of having fun, but also because I have an eBay budget, what I tell my students is I, I look for Pancheria things on eBay. And so I have found, you know, that there are guacamole dips, there are underwear, uh, there are playing cars, there are, you know, there are comic books, which the uh, comic books are a pretty big collection of things that, that there are. But definitely, I think the underwear is one of the funniest things I've seen. And the playing cards, and of course there are there are puppets, and there are keychains, shirts, and and so I, I really think he would have a he would have a laugh. So you mentioned earlier, and you talk about in your uh, essay, big idea essay about collective memory and belonging. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then we have a question from the audience: Who are some of the scholars you look to when researching um, collective memory? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So, I, I think collective. So, one of the things that I that I that I explore in the manuscript that I'm working on is, if it weren't for everyday people, Via's memory wouldn't have been um, safeguarded and and passed on. So there are a lot of you know the image isn't perfect, but it's it's it exists. And so, it's it. I think it it is really important that. People do have a voice in, in who will be remembered. And that's what I think Via is. He is because, at least in, in Mexico, he, he wasn't deemed as, as one of the head figures of the revolution until everyday people said, well, we, we beg to differ. So that I think is important, right? So, so sometimes we, we, we see that holidays might be imposed or certain political figures might be imposed by <clears throat> social hierarchy but if people if everyday people are like we, we don't observe that holiday or we really don't care about that individual then that you know that holiday fades away or that person fades away so it really i think that the image of via is a grass root uh image and that's why it's so so significant and so present and it, it, it ever growing or, or or nurturing itself from from for more collective memory Right, so that that's what I think it is. Well, that's why I think collective memory is important. And on the counter side, right, it it is a way of communities of seeing themselves. So maybe they don't reflect, like they don't they don't see themselves as revolutionaries, but they they see themselves as maybe underdogs or the heirs to you know the, to, to to the intellectual well being that that Via wanted. Like, Via wanted everybody to have a fair shot at life. Uh, and so I, I think that's that's a fair, fairly you know honest uh, thing that the the American way kind of you know showcase like if you're giving equal opportunities you should be able to excel and I I, I think in looking at Via that's what he wanted for for, for Mexicans in the 19 teens. Great. And any scholars you look to when you're talking about collective memory? Maurice Hallbox um on collective memory um i for me i, I specifically look at, at frederick katz uh i do look at memoirs that are there are for and against the uh, there are many on both sides and so it's um the, the I, I i i do look at more scholars for collective memory but they, they are escaping my mind at the moment um <laughs> Th that's yeah, but that that's uh, but I uh, Maurice Hallbox for sure I, I do use, um um, and so it's um, it's it's interesting. It's always interesting to read via stuff because it's it's always opinionated. It's it's never a a objective. It, it's always like on one side of the on the yes or you know via is a bandit or via is a not a saint but definitely a more balanced figure. Yeah. So we have a, another question from the audience. I'm not sure if you know the answer, but what happened to the Hollywood movie that he acted in? I read that the film has been lost. 
Correct. So back in the 19 teens, um, uh, movie the, the movie companies if if, uh, if you they, they would send on the movies and for you to get the next movie you would have to send back the original movie that you were you were you were screening at which point it was destroyed so that's why most 99.9 percent .9 of the movies of the 19 teens or at least the via movie was destroyed um there was a scholar uh by the last name of rocha Who's, who tried to look for, for the, the, the lost reels of Pancheria, and he found snippets of it in, in, a, in somebody's basement in El Paso, Texas. And so there was a family down in El Paso uh, that didn't give back the movie. And instead of instead what they did in the 1920s, they pieced out the movie and they, they recreated scenes of the, of, of the movie. As they, they recreated the assassination. And so... What, what survived is their home movie with sections of the original 1914 movie. Oh, so wow. that, that is actually like one of those, if somebody has a copy of that movie, it is, it's a collectible item for sure. That's really interesting. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, that, you know, talking about via and collective memory, we started out the, our discussion, you know, and you mentioned four key figures of the Mexican Revolution, right? Villa, Zapata, Carranza, Obregón, and two of those four, correct me if I'm wrong, became presidents, right, of yes. New Mexico. We don't remember them. <laughs> we remember Villa and Zapata. <laughs> yes, we, we do remember Villa and Zapata. And and uh, you know and that's part of the process, right? Uh, Zapata's Zapata's fight was very his his goal was 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 very uh, focused. He wanted land reform, and so he, when when he is he's assassinated in 19, 19, 20, 1919, and his followers will be will form part of the Obregón government in the nineteen twenty. So they will be in charge of creating that image and exalting that image of Zapata within the, you know, Mexican, the Mexican, Mexican history. For me, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated because there really isn't a, a group until the 1930s, 40s that, that start pushing the envelope and, and, and start getting this permission from the government. So Villa's mythification process or at least incorporation into the government be, uh, is much later on. And and I mean yes, or, or Carranza is also assassinated in nineteen nineteen. Um, so everybody's all, all four are assassinated. Even over, over even over himself is assassinated by by a what, what I'm going to call a radical Catholic in nineteen twenty eight because of the Cristero re revolt. Well, thank you so much. I have learned so much. This has been truly fascinating and um, it's been a lot of fun talking about Via and um, the, 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 the historical figure and Via the myth. So we uh, really appreciate it. So I'll turn it back over to Julie. Thank you so much to both of you, Marco and Valerie. What a really interesting conversation. I mean, I could have listened to more and I I thought I knew more about uh, the character, but it turns out I didn't. So this has been really, really enlightening. Um, you know, this comes to the end of our season of Big Idea. Uh, we'll be back in the fall. We're taking the summer off and we hope those of you who are in the audience will join us as we explore other big ideas in humanities scholarship. When I think back on the last few months, you know, as we you know, listen to Marco today. Last month, we heard from Gary Jackson, the award-winning poet who talked to also about poetry and memory. Um, we've learned about African-American genealogy with Sherry Camp. We've talked about Harriet Tubman on her anniversary with Dr. Kim Warren, and the list goes on and on. And so we're looking forward to what the next season brings. And we want to say a special thanks to Marco and Valerie and invite everyone back in the fall. See you then.